Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Mind Eyes episode 75 with Amin and Mr. Cheesy Smile. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it, bro. Alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, your eyes are like covered up. They're shaded. I have so... a haircut, bro. Oh, okay. Is that why, or do you always wear caps? I don't know. My dad always wears hats, so I've just sort of adopted that as my, uh, my mm. thing. It's quite good, oh, no. actually. I didn't warn you, actually, previously that my son is sleeping here. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> just forgot to mention. The latest no, arrival. Put, yes. I did, mm. I did put him to bed just before we started, so I'm oh, hoping he kind of... Should sleep if for he, a while. If he kicks off, then I have mm. a backup plan. Mm. What's, uh, what's Ramadan like with two kids? Hey, I've had this. I'm just texting my wife. Apologies. Um, sorry. I've had like the whole up until the, you know, up until now I've had Ramadan off work, which is a first for a very long time. Oh, really? Um, yeah. I haven't been working. Mm. So, um, oh, he's just about to get abducted. He's... <laughs> Maybe we can start again. No, it's okay. It's all natural. He's getting taken out of the room now. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, I haven't been working for like since Ramadan began, maybe just before Ramadan, actually. So it's been a very different experience. Usually I'm used to having to balance it, but also it's been different for everyone, isn't it? Because of the lockdown. And yeah, yeah. Say I, should, I'll close and stuff. I thought so, you wouldn't like be allowed to take time off. I took time off because everybody cancelled their holidays. Mm. So I had a lot of annual, annual, our annual leave sort of reset. Um, mm. at the beginning of April and uh, because of the lockdown and flights getting cancelled a lot of my colleagues had cancelled their holidays which meant there was a lot of opportunity for people to take time off mm. they wanted to and with with what what happened with my dad um, I took a few days off anyway and then mm. they were like you know take some time off compassionate leave or whatever you want mm. and I said okay I took the compassionate leave off look, compassionate leave off but I've already had compassionate leave um, previously or something similar and mm. I didn't want to be a, like you just don't want to milk things you just want to stand on your two feet so I said I don't really want favours I'd rather just take what I'm entitled to mm -hmm. which is the holiday so I took that and they were fine with that um, mm. and I'm going back the day after tomorrow inshallah so it's going to be strange I haven't been to work in like a month <laughs> wow I know. how's it been Ramadan wise uh, family wise it's been good to be with the family bro I spent a lot of um, if not all up until a few days ago with my, my mom and my, you know, my family, we sort of stayed with them. Um, and with my dad, cause he's here and it's been good to be around them and stuff. Um, that's the the biggest Ramadan vibe is, is just being with your family because at yeah. the moment, obviously we can't do, you know, we can't do Tarawih. We can't go to the masjid. We can't, can't see anybody else. It's mm. quite, it's quite strange. So on one hand, it does, it definitely feels like Ramadan because of the food we're eating. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's uh, just an odd one. How's it over there in the UAE? Mm. Um, uh, nothing specific over here would be different. I don't think. I mean, obviously, we don't have Tarawih. Um, but I, honestly, bro, I feel like it's a normal Ramadan for the most part. Honestly, because mm. uh, maybe it's because uh, usually over here. Tarawih is like not that long. It's like a share and Tarawih might be 45 minutes. You know, it's not the longest kind of thing. And so you're kind of in and out. And then the way I see it, it's like, okay, I did that. That's like a minimum thing. Then it's like, okay, the real effort is like, okay, maybe I'll pray extra at home, that kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, so this year it's instead of Tarawih is like an automa automatic thing. It's like, okay, let me like do my own Tarawih kind of thing. Yeah. So, but that's been really good, man. I really, uh, I really like it. And I would consider doing this every year now, like just praying at home and stuff. Mm. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, there is no, I suppose with Tarawih in the masjid, there's no fundamental requirement for it to be in the masjid, is there? Mm. Um, I, I think it's, what I've noticed is that families can often miss out because especially like with my family you've got um, mostly women so i don't really get to see them much in ramadan if i'm going to the masjid back and forth mm. it's just I, I can't even really enjoy iftar but before Aisha comes in mm -hmm. so i've got to sort of eat quickly and then go by the time i get to the masjid then Aisha would have started so so it has been it's been strange knowing that oh i've got the rest of the night but also you know two kids trying to sort of balance 
sleeping arrangements and stuff like yeah now that i've been off work i've tried to help my wife out but what i'll do which i find easier is to stay up at night and then like when he wakes up i'll feed him at night and stuff like that mm. and then i will I'll sleep maybe up until like 12 midday mm. whilst mm. my wife takes care of him yeah. but that means i don't really get to see her that much because mm-hmm. she'll sleep early i won't get to stay yeah. she won't get to stay up with mm. me anyway mm. that's why it changes bro you know like uh, this is, I think, something that hit a lot of people with when Ramadan, you know, Ramadan came and the masajid mostly closed and everything. Mm. Is the social aspect of Ramadan kind of went out the window? And definitely. And the thing is, like, uh, I know for a lot of people that was a big hit, but I think the reality is that maybe Ramadan shouldn't be like that. Maybe we shouldn't have that expectation of Ramadan. Like, it should be more like, Oh, it's it's the month where it's like, don't talk to me, like, don't message me a lot, don't yeah. expect fast response. Maybe it should be that expectation. Obviously, we don't have that in our culture currently, but maybe that should be the yeah. norm eventually. You know, if we're doing things right. I think for me, I, I realized how much you know how they they talk about obviously the shayatin you know, are locked up during Ramadan, yeah. and they talk about the, if you're still falling into mistakes and stuff, then a lot of that is going to be from your own actions and your own sort of mm, nefs, your own mm. sort of nefs. But then I've also realized on the flip side, um, how much good am I doing when I've got no one else doing it around me? You know, mm. how much, you know, how much a better am I doing when I don't know that there's a, the community is getting involved in a better, how much, you know, how clean are my intentions? If I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to start away mm. because maybe, um, I'm worried what people will think. Do you understand? Yes, I'm worried, if, you're not showing I'm up, worried yeah. if, I'm, if I don't show up, mm. um, so the, there is that element of it where I'm thinking, subhanAllah, am mm. I, Am I doing it sincerely or am I doing mm. it for other people? Yeah. Um, mm. It's definitely been a good Ramadan for taking responsibility for your own ibadah and your own mm. iman, isn't it? Definitely. And, uh, and maybe, you know, maybe some of us would have found it really hard. And, um, you know, that just lets you know kind of maybe where you are. And, and now you know the reality kind of thing. So you can work on it, right? It, mm. It's not like first time, first time you do a Ramadan kind of without, uh, Tarawih without the kind of social aspect that you should be hit the ground running you know some people yeah. you know we're gonna need to get used to it and stuff like that so yeah it's very strange bro strange times we're living in I know we spoke about the, the virus and stuff many times but um, it just shows you how like blessings can just be taken away so quickly like you just don't know you don't know what you've got, you know, available to you today to earn Allah's mercy that may, you may not have the opportunity to, and we live very comfortable lives. So we just don't know. You just get used to putting things to the side and saying, Oh, I'll, I'll take advantage of that one day. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do this one day. I'll do this sort of a better one day before mm-hmm. you know it, that opportunity is gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, I mean, mm-hmm. um, speaking of opportunities to do good, <laughs> um, I, I like I, that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I can, obviously we we we've uh, previous. I think it was the previous episode, the one just before, where you made an announcement regarding um, a project that you're working on. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I haven't, I, although I've, I've I've definitely contributed. I haven't um, had a good look at the progress so far and what we're up to in terms of your goal for saying mm-hmm. that. So, yeah. w- where are you at on that sort of? Right. So like just an hour ago, alhamdulillah, whoever it was, Rabbi Zikhir, he gave just the perfect amount to reach the current goal, where the current goal was, right? Okay. So it was like, awesome. uh, he gave 279 pounds, mashallah, okay. the, the, the highest amount given so far in one go. So now uh, we're at 1,400 pounds raised. And, uh, you know, honestly, when I started it, I didn't um, honestly, no idea what to expect. I did think I could reach 500 definitely. Mm. Um, and that's just like from personal context and people who regularly listen to the podcast or watch my videos or whatever. But, um, beyond that, and uh, the aim was to hit that in the first day, which alhamdulillah, mm. uh, I think I did uh, 650 pounds in the first day. Um, but then after that, I was like, okay, alhamdulillah, great. That's really amazing. You know, hit that in the first day. Now, where do I take it from here? I had it in my head that 2,000 pounds would be good in terms of comfortably being able to give people their pre-orders and everything. And then uh, also have that extra money for getting very high quality kind of book cover designed and then uh, extra for any promotional things that, uh, that I need to do, right? Because yeah. it's not just about 
those 50 people or whatever who want the, the kind of pre-order it. It's not just about getting them the book. It's about putting the book out there and getting it out there and getting people to know about it and consume it and benefit from it. Mm. So I don't think I explained actually what the <laughs> campaign is, right? So, um, so I basically, over the last year, on and off, I've been working on basically a book, right? And the book is, work, is, is developing a model for uh, Islamic masculinity. Basically, what is the role of a man? You know, if you're looking to guidance from Allah and his messenger, والسلام, and what are the traits of a man? Uh, you know, what's the do's and don'ts of a man? What's the aspirational traits um, of a man, right? And, uh, you know, there's many reasons uh, I wanted to do this, but basically that's what I've been working on. And so finally in Ramadan, I went live with the campaign on Launch Good. Um, well, you could check out all the details there. Like, I think the page is quite good in terms of explaining what it's all about and what, what you're going to, how you're going to benefit uh, me and the Ummah and stuff by, by contributing. Uh, Launchgood.com slash better, better men. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, yeah, so you can learn about it there. But basically uh, this month I wanted to go out there, get some, uh, pre-orders see where the interest is at and then uh, get some financial help in order to you know put some of that important stuff together so that when the book is actually fully fully done then i can like fully go roll it out and stuff and, and do the initial print of the books in terms of pre-orders is that is that linked to the people that donate or is that a separate sort of thing so to so the there... way it works bro is like uh if you it's the same link and it's like if you pre-order one copy for example I'm aware that the amount I would need to precisely print the book is it's uh, what you would pay for the for the pre-order is more than that. But that's because I've built into it uh, you also helping helping with the other costs, basically. You know, so it's like if it costs me I don't know five pounds to print a book, um, and you you've contributed twenty pounds, then that extra fifteen pounds could go to printing another book, and then maybe the other ten pounds might go towards the cover design or something like that. Let me have a look quickly at, um, let me have a look at the, oh, I'm on launch good now actually. So it was launch good slash better mm. man, was that? Better men, yeah. Better men. Mm. <sighs> mashallah, mashallah, here we go. Mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. So you click on support and that, like I said, so does that mean that anyone who supports automatically is also pre-ordering or is that, oh, is there different levels? Yeah, exactly of, the level. Ah, yeah. that's yeah. what I'm. I don't remember what I did, but that's okay. That's interesting. That's really cool. Mm. It's a very so good platform. There's many different like options. So you could do one pre-order, two pre-orders, but then the further you go down in terms of higher amounts, then it's like, it's more towards the end of just purely contributing and helping me reach more people with it and mm. stuff. And I think for anybody listening to my house and anyone who's followed you on Sierra Masters for the many many years now it's almost like this is like the culmination of all your all the work that you've done so far i remember you saying that you always wanted to produce some book and i think it's definitely something that would benefit um you know the the audience that you've tapped into uh for, for this long mm. uh, to have something that they can always refer back to and something that they can mm. i mean it's just such a it's, it's it's such a profound area to discuss in this day and age and i don't think that it's something that is looked into uh, mm. that much. You know, we, 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 if we look at the lectures and we read uh, classical books and stuff, we've got, we've obviously got our role models as clear as day. We've got the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we've got the Sahaba, we've got the, the prophets of old. Um, and it's just about translating that into mm. what that means. You know, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's one thing having an example and describing an example of somebody it's another thing translating mm -hmm. that into what does that mean for you as an individual how do mm -hmm. you act yeah. upon that as an individual yeah. you know and sometimes it's just about if you if you search for this topic on youtube or something you will find a few lectures here or there but it's obvious that uh, no one yet has like really um put just the time and effort really into focusing on this topic you know most mm -hmm. uh, shiuch however they're doing a great job um, basically dealing with the really uh, essentials that th their community needs, isn't it? You know, the, mm. the, 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 aqeedah, the, the belief, the strong belief, the uh, prayers and the, and some social issues as well. But this is, you know, it's quite, it's quite a topic that's like specific, isn't it? And yeah. so, although they might touch on it and there are some good lectures out there, but they will only ever cover a small part of it because that's not their focus. Right. So, mm. you know, why not somebody pick an area that hasn't been, covered by by people and then go all in on that focused area mm. you know
Mm. And that's where the best work is produced during that sort of time of focus. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. No, inshallah, okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm excited for it, to be honest. I mean, what are we looking at in terms of time frame for when? Mm. Is it... <laughs> it's, it's, you always got to add three months to what you think, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, but I think in the next six months, inshallah, will be definitely out, inshallah. 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 So, like that's trying to be middle ground, like not too optimistic, yeah. not too pessimistic, because I'm aware that like, I'm, you know, I could have done, bro. I could have gone to one Yanni Sheikh who definitely, he offered to help me actually. Uh, he, he heard yeah. about the idea and he's like, look, I'm down, like I'll help you out. And he probably would have written yeah. the whole book for me and then let me put my name on it. Yeah. <laughs> but I kind of wanted to, um, I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to do the hard work. And then, and then once I've done that, then I'll go get it checked. I'll get any, any suggestions and I'll work from mm. there because I don't want it to be a scholarly academic book. I want it to be more of an accessible, more casual book uh, that the average person can kind of relate to. And it's like, yeah. I feel like this kind of topic, as an example, there are many topics like this. It could be the gate through which um, somebody who's not too close to the, to the dean could get closer, right? Because mm. they see something, they see it's, it's just relevant to their life that it's like, I, I vote, for example, for example, somebody living the, the quote unquote like street life. Yeah. yeah. I, they, they might recognize that they're spending their whole life trying to prove they're a real man. And then, and they're not, they're not close to Allah. And then they read this or they, it's not about reading because I, I know many people won't read it, but it's about getting information out there. And the book is mm. like just the first stage of that. Um, so they might hear about some of the stories or whatever from the book. And then it's like, Oh, well, yeah, I'm Muslim in the end. I might be far from Allah. I'm, I'm Muslim. And wow, that story's amazing. Wow, that guy was sick. Like he's, he's got that, those masculine traits that I understand. Like I could relate to that. But it's like, yeah, wow, yeah, he's yeah. also got that self-control that I could really respect. So it's like, you know, um, I feel like that could also be a gateway for people as well, you know? Definitely. I mean, it would be a miss to, to, to negate all of, the, um, all of the buzz that this topic has, even amongst the non-Muslim communities. Um, like this obviously we've got like uh i forget his name jordan peterson and yeah and even like i don't know if you know elliot host he's very of course yeah sort of, mm. he's very into i like some of his stuff and, actually uh, it's yeah quite, it's quite insightful he's very um he's transformed a lot recently i was i started following him on instagram again recently and i was like oh mm. did he dye his hair pink yeah no <laughs> but he's definitely treading some uh different waters mm. in terms mm. of his political mm. you know really? persuasion Something yeah. interesting I, I heard from him, this probably a year ago now, is that he stopped helping women, basically. He said, look, um, I, I noticed that when I do, I think he does some camps, like training camps, you know, like where yeah. it's like intensive camp where you come and you push your physical limits or something like that, yeah. right? And he's like, I noticed that when there's men and women together, the vibe is completely different. And the men are all focused on what the women are going to think and this and that. Whereas yeah. when it's just men, there's this... Uh, camaraderie there's like this kind of brotherhood this kind of different vibe completely and mm. that's what i wanted i wanted more of that and so like i hope someone does this whatever for women but i just want to do it for men so yeah that was interesting i remember that what's it what, what's he I on mean, now uh, so he's it's just, this is strange really I, I i think the more it's very it's a very odd uh, th phenomenon i'm witnessing the more it's women we spoke about before in Mind Heist, we spoke about left wing and right wing, and how mm -hmm. like you've got this sort of there are elements of the left that we find in Islam, like um, ideas, for example, not obviously the whole you know scenario, yeah. but ideas that we find. But however, if you were to go all the way with that, you you know, you lose out on on fundamentals of our religion. And the same with with the right wing. Mm -hmm. And he's gone very like pro Trump, pro sort of that side of the fence. Yeah. Um but just before I noticed that he was speaking, like you said, he was he was saying things that when from our fifth row, he was saying things that you know he said. God, he was, he'd make some very bold statements like, um, you know, don't even look at a woman. Like that was mm. something very bold. Like don't even look at other women. Um, mm. Don't even look at women in general. Like don't give them that ability to to control you. Some of the things he was saying, like people were commenting underneath, saying, "Oh, some Muslims," because I recognize yeah. obviously Muslim names, were saying, "Oh, you're literally one step away." Even I commented, bro, and I never comment on anybody's <laughs> things. <laughs> Don't comment on non-Muslim stuff at all. Oh. Um, but even he, even I said, uh, "You know, you're you're one step away from from you know just taking your shahada and, <laughs> and, and acknowledging uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala." So, um, are you still there, bro? Yeah, uh, just the videos. Sorry, it's just, a, it's just, mm. oh, okay. So yeah, so even I commented and um, 
but then I started seeing a bit because obviously what's going on in America right now is they've got very sort of what's well, happening worldwide. But like there's there's people that are leaning more towards the this this coronavirus thing is a bit exaggerated and we shouldn't be locked down, etc. Yeah. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which mm. are like and Allah knows best, Akhi, Allah knows mm. best, but. It seems to be those that are very pro-Trump are mm. against this locking down business mm. and against this sort yeah. of precautionary You know, I think it is. A, measures. I think uh, um, Trump has, uh, he's basically, he's gathered a group of people who are not necessarily pro-Trump because it's almost like Trump doesn't have his own ideas. He has an attitude and a way of being and a, be, a, a conduct, but it's like he doesn't have like clear policies, mm. obviously, right? But what he attracts is anybody who... Is a, is, a, is a rebel, is, uh, wants to think differently, doesn't want to follow the mainstream. That mm. is what, uh, what Trump attracts to him, right? So Elliot Hulse, for example, he's always been that guy, that different thinker, right? Even, you know, yeah. maybe people like you or me, we're, like, we're used to being outside the mainstream in some of our thoughts. Though, in that sense, I think we all have that little admiration for Trump. When Trump just pulls out of this mm. agreement or does that, it's like, yeah, I... Like, I see that in you, you know, I like that. Yeah. I think it's the boldness and it's yeah. the the difference. I mean, I remember when Trump first came into office and I was looking into the sort of the history of the Republican Party and the history of the, the Democrats and, and how actually it's not necessarily about him, but it's about the, the change in, uh, I don't know, dynamics that he brings to the table. He's not a politician, so he doesn't yeah. behave like one. Yeah. And because of people's distrust in politicians... Um, it's like he just came in and blew the water out. You know what mm. I mean? Blew, mm -hmm. blew, blew the roof off the house sort of mm -hmm. thing. Mm. Um, and that, that speaks for a lot of things. I mean, it is strange, actually, because we, maybe we're, we are living in a transitionary period where, you know, we're going to see more of this. We're going to see more people that take power that aren't necessarily your traditional politicians. Um, sometimes, mm. you know, despite the fact that, despite the fact that, you know, pol politicians may have their, you know, you know, we have their stereotypes about them and stuff. Sometimes you look at how, you know, Trump and people like him conduct themselves. You're like, oh, I wish there was, you kind of want to be lied to by a politician with a silver tongue just to feel a bit comfortable and things mm -hmm. feel like the things are under control. You know, you look, yeah. you look at maybe how Obama used to speak and you think, well, you know, at least he, he sounds like he knows what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, whether you believe him or not, it's like, well, at least he's kind of calm and, you know, his personality, <laughs> there's an yeah. aura of like, I'm in mm. control of what's going on here. Yeah. Whilst when, you know, anyway, it's hard to explain, but mm. it's, 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 it's a weird transitionary period where it's almost like we're going back to like, you know, these, you hear these fairy tales of like the, the, I don't know, the very flamboyant Kings and, queens of the past that basically did whatever they wanted and got whatever they wanted sort of thing mm. um and they didn't need to serve the people with with the correct sort of speech they just got away with what they wanted to get away with quite openly mm. um and i think i can't remember who said this but they, they said you know what i prefer trump over obama for example because uh, you know i'm not making a bold statement here but they could say at least at least trump can lie and he will lie to my face as opposed to do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, he'll be yeah, honest. Trump will say, you know, he'll say, he'll I say, hate, I don't want Muslims in the country, for yeah. example. Whereas yeah. Obama would say, yeah, we love Muslims, come Muslims, yeah, yeah, great. But then he'll bl blow up Libya and, and uh, whatever, <laughs> yeah. and Somali and stuff. I suppose, you know, if you've got somebody that can be upfront, then at least you, you can read them quite easily. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's, there's the thing, bro. It's like there's these uh, traits are something that are universal that people appreciate universally. And it doesn't mean that mm. he's a great guy. I'm talking about the traits, yeah. The traits uh, that people can they, they undeniably appreciate these traits. And that's even when you look at like masculine traits, there are certain traits that tend to be uh, that me real men hold and they have held. And this mm. is like uh, re universal across uh, any religion or culture. So, you know, for, ex for example, uh, courage or aggression, right? So for example, now in, in, the, in the more the left-leaning kind of worldview or whatever, they might not appreciate um, aggression in somebody, right? They yeah. might say, oh no, you have to be very careful and, uh, you know, tread on, uh, what's it called, eggshells, like you're treading on eggshells and yeah. be careful of everyone's feelings. But there is something innate in every normal person on the fitra that when they see someone being aggressive towards their goal or whatever, they, they appreciate and they admire that. 
they mm. might disagree with the goal that you're being aggressive going towards, but just the fact that you're being aggressive and you're bold, no, you know, you can't deny this is a good trait. Uh, and and mm. that, that's basically the part of the idea behind the book is that, okay, like I could have done a book about masculine traits, right? But no, it's about good, like what traits does a good Muslim man hold? Right. So it has to be that, you know, that like think of a Venn diagram. It's the, the crossover between being a masculine and being a good Muslim. You know, it's like these things combined, not just being masculine. Mm -hmm. It's also, I suppose, about um, finding that oh, my internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. I suppose it's also about finding that balance between uh, how, how, how best to enact on, I wouldn't say feminine characteristics. I wouldn't say that at all, but I would say like the softer side of our, our, you know, our, some of the softer side of our religion, the side of, of, of being merciful, the side of helping people, the side, you know, because you can, you can swing that pendulum either way and you need to sort of keep it in the middle, really. Yeah. Because at what point do you, what point do you take your right off somebody? At what point do you, you know, stop forgiving someone? At what point do you draw the line? You know, mm -hmm. I think that's where things can get lost, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because the moment your honor is slandered or whatever, like I had some, I had someone on Twitter just now and I don't really use Twitter that much. I had someone on Twitter just now absolutely like make the out against me for something ridiculous, bro. <laughs> um, which was very strange, very strange. Mm. But it made me think like, I actually thought about this as that, that sort of um, tweet came through and I was thinking, um, how do I respond to this? Like, do I stoop down to their level? Do I insult them or do I, uh, you know, and I just thought, okay, maybe if you make dua for somebody, that's great. But do they learn a lesson if I do that? Like, mm. just what I'm trying to say. And what would yeah. be the, 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 the best thing to do as a man? Like, mm -hmm. maybe ignore it completely. But then you think, mm. what lesson have they learned? They're just allowed to carry on this sort of ridiculous mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it, these are the sort of mm -hmm. things you think about. You think well, that's, about how a, best to that's like yourself. a simple situation. Uh, but it happens, like, it happens regularly, right? And All maybe, I don't know if a... I guess uh, women can kind of understand and relate, but uh, often for a man, his, his ego could get triggered easier than a woman uh, on average. Mm. Right. Um, and so I think it's about uh, balancing so many different things, even though this scenario is simple, but you need certain elements. Right. So firstly, uh, actually, if you look at the great men in Islam, they, they had no ego. They had no, they had, uh, they were humble. They're humble to Allah. They were humble mm. in front of the people, but they, they understood that they, they have dignity and they deserve a certain level of dignity, right? Um, and then the other big area I think that applies to this is self-control. Yeah. Almost uh, out of all of the, you know, different hadith, different this and that I've looked at, I think the number one trait of a man is self-control, right? And so at this point, when somebody has said something like that to you, it's about staying in control, not letting the ego get involved, and then saying, okay, now that I've, I'm in control, it's not my emotions or my ego speaking here. Now, what do I do? Right. Mm. And, it, and I think it could go either way. I think you have different models of being a man, right? It's not just that you are always soft, or always this. And so as long as your un, things are under control, your emotions under control, mm. there's no ego in it. Then it's like, okay, I'm going to decide to make an example of this guy or I'm going to make dua for him in, in secret yeah. kind of thing. And I think either, either one of those goes, but the key is that you're in control. You're not lashing out. Mm. And if you think about it, bro, like what, what men do we respect? We always respect men who are in control. We don't respect mm. the man. You know, if you think of, uh, I can't remember the film exactly, but you know, Scarface, he's like, at some point, he's crazy rich. He's uh, involved all kinds of women. He's full of drugs yeah. in his system. At that point, it's like what, made, what got him up there is now, you know, he's t taking him down. He's, you can't yeah. respect that guy. Like you respected at first the hustle, the this, the that. But then it's like, you just feel sorry for the guy because he yeah. lost control. He lost self-control. That's the most important thing. I think for, like when I am met with um, decisions to make or situations to deal with, you know, whether that's between family members, between friends or whatever, it's usually it's within family. Like if I can see a disagreement within a family or the family have disagreed with me or something, it's like, 
my react I, th- I have to pause and think whatever i do is going to affect the reputation i have and if i re- if my reputation is affected then my ability to lead this family is also dismantled yeah you know the moment like the people that you are responsible over see a chink in your armor then suddenly your authority is diminished a little mm. bit mm. Um, because like you said if they can't see that you're in control then how can you control the the, the fate of this family so to mm-hmm. speak yeah um yeah so, so I often like, think that's you know, like a topic that comes up in terms of being emotionally vulnerable as well. That's a big topic mm, for men, isn't it? And uh, definitely, you know, the women out there, they would like to say that, you know, men should just be completely open emotionally. Um, you know, men are suffering because they're, they're too closed off emotionally. Um, on the other hand, I'm sure you'll find many women whose husbands are very much out there emotionally. They feel like it's too much, right? So yeah. again, there's a balance there. And I feel like, again, we've got, um, messages from from the Quran and the Sunnah that guide us towards the middle path there definitely I've, I've definitely you know I've had many examples where um, I've consciously made a decision to upset uh, you know certain family members whether that's my wife or my my even my mother or my sisters um, to upset them in that moment because I know in the long run um, mm it's actually it safeguards the situation that we're in you know mm. uh, whether that's you know it could be anything by upsetting i don't mean i actively go and do something to hurt yeah. them i mean yeah. like um, i may not do something or choose to do something other than what they might the way have requested mm. um you understand yeah. uh, because i'm not thinking about them i'm thinking about the entire the, the course, unit yeah. the family as a mm. whole i'm not thinking mm. about this individual issue and i see that a lot now and mm. i think i learned that a lot <laughs> i learned that a lot from my father mm. um now only because not because he's told me but when i you know with what's going on with my dad i've been able to speak to him about essentially his whole life story and he's he's sat and spoken to me about literally from the start of like you know when he first ever came why he came to europe and how he came to europe and what and some of the things bro was just incredible like i didn't realize that Mm. he you know you know uh, i'm sure he won't mind me saying but at one point he was literally like sleeping in the streets bro Mm. um looking for work which and I was just like, well, surely, you know, surely going back to Tunisia was better than doing that. Like, surely, how did you even do that when you didn't have mobile phones? You didn't have internet. You didn't it's just, like, well, I'll get up and I, do you know what I mean? I'll get up and I'll go to, you know, look for, for work in this place. And then they'll send me here and he'll just figure things out. Like he, it was almost like this Tawakal where you just figure things out, bro. Mm. You know, and some of the coincidences, well, I say coincidences, but some of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in his place, like, could you imagine like, Someone that you get into a taxi with in, in Tunisia is someone you bump into in the middle of Switzerland or something like that. Like it was those kind of coincidences. Like he'd be on his last penny. He'd be on his last penny. And I, I remember him saying that he was in a train station and he just bumped into this guy that he knew in Tunisia that was sitting in a taxi with him when he was on his way there and he, who sort of helped him out and pointed him in the right direction sort of thing. Anyway, like one thing led to another and I'm just sitting here like we can make a movie out of this. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But yeah. my, I think the, the biggest thing that sort of the biggest thing that left impression on me was that our, you know, the generations before us weren't afraid to live in discomfort to achieve something that they believed was, you know, was grand. Mm-hmm. Um, whilst we, at least me, you know, I'm very sort of, I know that I'm very sort of um, hesitant to let go of the comforts that I have to do anything quite substantial, you know. Um, and it's fascinating actually like they they talk about it there's that famous quote about you know um, hard times create strong men mm. but then strong men create good, good times, times and good times mm. yeah and good times mm. create weak men you know mm. and he's just like well what generation am I living in right now mm. Mm. <laughs> you know subhanallah mm. definitely man you know on this topic you know if you what if you if you go to the page uh, the launch good page then in the video there um i mentioned that basically men are today being often pushed in one of two directions um mm. it's either that you are the basically the hollywood masculine guy right you 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 don't actually chase women you get women to chase you you exploit them you disrespect them you have no interest in having a family you're not like most responsible guy and your egos are out of control right that's yeah. one model and that's like the you know what everyone would attack and say tos- toxic masculinity etc the other one is the other basically the opposite extreme where you're very passive you, you, there's no aggression to you there's no boldness um you don't stand up for things and you're kind of just uh, 
you know, you're, you're like a super feminist, you, know, you, you, you don't see the innate traits of men and women and all of that. You don't take leadership, all of that. So this is the two extremes that, that men are being pushed down. And I think every man who's in touch with his nature, he re recognizes that, okay, the, la the latter one that I mentioned, he recognizes that's not me. Like, that's just, come on, like, come on. You know, you're, mm. you're pushing something on me, which is not natural whatsoever. And then as for the other one, I mean, there's so many, you know, tales of uh, disaster coming from that. And, you know, yeah. we know, we know the, the kind of sin and stuff that that leads to. So it's like, those are the two extremes really being shown to people. There, there's not really a middle ground being shown. Like, where are the stories of that middle ground? There are some, mm. there are a few, you know, there's still the value of, you know, the hardworking family man and stuff. Um, but there isn't always that much depth put into it. So this mm. is the goal, bro. I think it's very, you know what? I, I was just thinking how valuable this book may even be to, to sisters because mm. I think... I think women maybe struggle, especially those who aren't married yet, may struggle to realize what they want in a partner. Do you understand? Like, yes. it's very easy. I'm sure it's very easy to get caught up in what the the masses believe is the right person to go for. You know, mm. and you you hear about you hear stories about women that could have actively said no to to a suitor but then end up just being with the worst type of person and, and vice versa. You have it. I'm sure where women end up by worst person. I mean like that, the whole toxic masculinity side of things, but then you've also got women that maybe end up with somebody that isn't maybe man enough or doesn't yeah. take leadership mm. and they are forced to, to mm. fill, fill those boots, you know? Um, so it'd be interesting, I think for them to see what they, for, for them mm. to actually pick up the book and see what 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 mm. part of this book they can, whether they're married or not, whether they can sort of a try and approach or try and look for or make dua for even, you know, mm -hmm. it's easy. I think it's easier to make dua for something if you have a deep understanding of what it is that you want, because then you can be specific in your dua and then you can mm. have that sincerity. Um, so for something like this, I think definitely women benefit as well. I think it shouldn't be something that is is left yeah. to, um, to just to men to benefit from, you know. Mm. And you know what's surprising is that some of the things in, in so far that I'm like putting in the book, they're quite like obvious and Muslims kind of know it. But I feel like sometimes it needs to come from other than just a sheikh saying this is haram and this is halal, you know. Um, so, for example, you know, the ayah about al-rijal qawamun ala nisa, it's like the, the man is like the takes the leadership in the family and a woman must obey um, her husband and these kind of things. This is like basics right basics of islamic fiqh in terms of like rulings and haram and this it is oblig obligatory for a woman to obey her husband and all of that but beyond the just the ruling where is the discussion on the dynamics between the man and his wife the dynamics between the feminine and the masculine um and sometimes like i find it useful to think of the dynamics in a in another another environment where there's leadership and there's subordinates, right? So like yeah. in, a, in, a, in a business, in a company, like you have the leadership and you have the other people, you know, who are kind of take, they're, they're, who they're leading. And you don't see them as low, you just see them as in a different role. And you kind yeah. of appreciate the need to have like a lead, you know, leadership team and, and you're know, sitting in meetings, making decisions, strategizing this and that. So I think that sometimes because we're, maybe we're out of touch with, the, the, the natural dynamic of the feminine and the masculine. Sometimes it's good to like think of those kind of hierarchies and structures as well. And you'll kind of mm -hmm. appreciate the need to have like only one leader and the need to have like these kind of things. It's very, very natural. It's very natural. And That's a lot of the, like half of the, I would say probably half of the people so far contributing to the campaign are women, you know? So I yeah. think they understand, and maybe they understand the need for this more than the men. Um, mm. Definitely. It's interesting you spoke about work and, and hierarchies because my obviously where I work, it's a rank structure. So you've got real sort of, mm. you've got modes of, of, of even conduct with people that are of a different rank to you, which is, which initially was very daunting when I first went into it. But now like it's, it's almost natural to have this rank structure. And, you know, you judge people based on what they what it says on their shoulders, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which is interesting really, because uh, 
it doesn't really matter where they're from or who they are as long as their shoulder is a different sort of is a rank higher than yours you you, you have to and then the moment like you slip up like i remember once uh this guy he was quite new he started he sent an email to um you know someone who's a higher rank than him and he called mm. him by his first name mm. he's like oh it was something about some gym membership or something he's like oh hello ben blah 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 and yeah. i went to see this person this supervisor i went to see him um and he goes oh tell your friend not to call me that again like don't speak and i was like, oh yeah sorry i'm sure he didn't mean <laughs> like i was yeah. sort of, even though he's really good with me and if i was yeah. to call him by his first name i don't think he would mind because i've yeah. known him for that long but like you know what i mean like this mm. so th there is mm. these things do exist they're very squashed down and they're not very much discussed in society um mm. but actually when they are acted upon and accepted, they are very effective in doing what yeah. they need to do. It's all, it's all unspoken rules most of the time. Like yeah. when you have to write it in the job description or the contract or whatever that you must call this. So it, it looks a little bit ridiculous, looks a bit silly, like you're going to enforce yeah. calling someone by a certain name, right? But um, maybe that's because of, you know, everyone has different ideas. There's less of a homogenous culture these days. But um, normally, you know, it's, it makes absolute sense. It's completely understood why, yeah. you know, you, you treat your, you know, the uncles like this, the aunties like this, the, the half of this, the, the Haji this, you know, it's, uh, it all makes mm. absolute sense, you know, but when, bro, you I, know, when I, I was going to say, when I started, mm. I felt a bit rebellious about it all. And I was very anti all of these rules and regulations. Yeah. And now I'm a lot more like, actually, I see. I see the beauty of organization. I see the beauty of having structure mm. because then thing, things get done. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. There's always something to get back mm. to. Things get mm. done. Mm. But yeah, go on, bro. I know, I know in the, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, there was a one airline which had a ton of plane crashes, like all in mm. one go. Um, like all in the same year, they had like way more than the usual amount you would expect. And you know, the airline was South Korean Air, I believe, yeah? Okay. And they had a ton of crashes. And so they sent in, an outsider, so a non-Korean person to kind of do an analysis of like, what's going on here? What's the problem? And what they actually discovered is that the pilot is often making a mistake and the co-pilot wouldn't correct them because of the whole hierarchy thing. Yeah. Right. So they, they literally stayed silent and died because of it. Yeah. Because yeah. they wouldn't, they wouldn't dare speak out against that, the, the pilot. So, oh, no. So, uh, yeah, so what they did is they found also that in the Korean language, it, this hierarchy thing and the respect thing is very much built into the language. So one of the changes they made, they said, you've got to speak English. Everyone has to speak English to each other because it's more of that, like flattening the hierarchy kind of thing. So right. like that's like uh, taken too far in the other way. But it's interesting how different cultures got like it to a different level. Hmm. But bro, well, you know, I wanted awful. to explore this. Yeah. <laughs> what? Go on. I was going to say it must be awful to to be so. It must be such a big sort of uh, anxiety-inducing yeah. thing to speak up that you know to cause everybody yeah. to die. It's part of the wow, yeah, it's crazy. And you know, even me, like sometimes I'm working with clients who are older than me. Now, obviously, I might know more than me in my field, more than them in my field. But it's like I find it hard to like coach them and like tell them what to do, just because of that mm. age thing. And sometimes mm. I don't even see them. Like it's not like they're in front of me. But I just hear from their voice that they must be at least like 10 years older than me or something like that. And I'm just like, I don't want to like yeah, be yeah. telling them what to do. And yeah. sometimes that's a barrier to me actually, um, you know, getting the best out of them or out of the, the kind of situation, you know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is what it is. Um, yeah, bro, you know, like, I think it's interesting to talk about the whole idea of writing a book in general, right? Um, especially like Muslims or whatever, because it's a, it's a form of media. And I think there's something special about books, right? Because so basically the, the idea behind me doing a book, like why did I do a book? I could have done a podcast. I could have done, um, you know, a blog with all different articles. I could have just posted some random uh, posts on, on Instagram or whatever about the topic. But you know, what I think, and I think anyone who's you know interested in putting some, something out there in this kind of field of self betterment from an Islamic perspective, it's about, understanding that if you're serious about this uh, you need to have a, a strong understanding and writing a book forces you to develop a strong understanding you know mm. that is what basically why i'm writing a book i know like maybe people are thinking this i don't know if you thought this bro but like i'm not going to read a book like who, who reads books you know um but the point is to force myself to do the hard work so that then i end up with like 150 200 pages 
of well-researched, verified stuff that now that could turn into many different formats, right? But the fact that mm. I had to do the hard work, do the research, get it checked, and it's printed, right? I can't just edit the blog post, it's printed. Um, it forces a another level, I think, of discipline, of research, and just of readiness and commitment. Mm. So Definitely. I would recommend that to anyone who's like wants to go into any kind of field. Like um, I think you were thinking of doing something to with being a father and stuff like that. I know you didn't mention it publicly, but we'd be vague about it. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And, and like, that, so that would, that would go there. For example, you know, you're interested in fatherhood. It's like spend the time to get to know it. And yeah. then you'll, because the, the thinking behind it as well was, this is from an Islamic perspective, which means I've got to be very careful. Like I'm not a scholar out here, right? I'm mm. not, um, it's not even, I'm not qualified to give fatawa. It's like, I'm not even, uh, I wouldn't say I'm even reached intermediate level in, in all of the sciences or anything. And so it's like, okay, do I need to like go through that whole thing? Like a five years, six years of really getting into that. Um, and you know, my, what I thought is that, yes, I can't like be a sheikh because what I realized is who has an impact amongst the Muslims? It's actually the shiuch right amongst yeah. the, the practicing muslim it's the shuyukh it's the personality of the shuyukh he's got the word sheikh in front of his name he's got the word ustad in front of his name okay i'm going to follow his advice i'm going to follow his advice about uh, how to raise my kids even though mm. he might not even have kids but just because he's a sheikh you know and yeah, so yeah, yeah. i thought okay how can i kind of get maybe some of that credibility um without necessarily committing fully to going covering all the Islamic sciences in detail. And I think this might be that middle ground where it's like in this, only in this topic of like, let's say mus Muslim uh, masculinity or, you know, fatherhood in Islam or whatever, in this narrow field, I'm going to spend one year, two years, however long it takes to really know the ins and outs of it. I'm going to get a scholar, of course, to check my ideas and verify mm. the different hadith and stuff that I found. But then once I've kind of done that, I can speak about that topic. When people mm. ask me about other topics, like no doubt people might start asking me about, okay, what's the woman's role? What should a woman do? Like I need, need to discipline myself to say, look, I didn't research that stuff, right? And so it's like the idea that you can, if you go narrow, uh, you can actually become quite well versed in that topic, you know? Definitely, definitely. I think that, and the fact that you said, like you just said, it's not something you're just going to throw out there into the, you know, into the system. <laughs> the audience without getting it checked anyway and i think that's the most most important thing like anyone who's who's worth their 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 weight in in you know being an author mm. even if you know you're just starting to get that checked by other people is it shows the sincerity behind it and i think that's <laughs> it's that's scary, be part of it. i'm sure it is but at the same <laughs> time i don't think it, you know let's be realistic i don't think anyone's going to say to you no you know what bin this book don't try doing this they'll they'll correct and they'll advise and they'll yeah you know yeah, well, that's a what good I'm thing. scared a of is thing. being told to like start again. <laughs> <laughs> but bro, do you know what? If you were told to start again, I think you would take it in your stride. I think you'd be disheartened, but then I think mm. you'd, you'd see it as an opportunity. Like, yeah, I, need to think I mean, I was speaking to my uh, my business partner just to get some kind of advice around it, and uh, he's like, "Why are you doing this?" Right? And I remember <laughs> I told him, I told him that this must be done. Like, yeah. it must it must be put out there. Um, yeah. Even if it's after I die that people kind of recognize its value or something, I need to do it, right? It needs to be out there. Even if my my book is like the first book on this topic and then someone else thinks it's rubbish and then they write a better version, it's at least starting that conversation. And, um, you know, if you think of some of the great scholars, I don't know if they were really thinking about how many downloads it would get or how many copies the book would sell. Like it was just um, this work needs to kind of be done, needs to be put mm -hmm. out there. And if, if you have uh, the right intention and you put the work in and you make dua and, and Allah puts barakah in it, then maybe when you release it, it will go have a huge impact. Maybe after you die, it'll have a huge impact. But mm. I think there are some topics like that where it's like, I'm all about judging demand and following demand. I get that, definitely. Um, but the, you have to mix, I think, with the thing of this needs to be done. And I will do this. And once I've done it, then I will try and, and market it well and put a twist mm. on it, which makes it attractive. Mm. Um, and I think some people have done that really well with their dawa. Like, I mean, this is an extreme example, but like, you know, like dawa man with his, uh, with his like, come and get free, like Louis Vuitton shoes in my <laughs> masjid yeah, thing. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's a bit too far, but it's like, the point is put an attractive twist on something to get people yeah. in the door, you know? Yeah, and. Yeah. I think many people have done that in different it's ways. Also, it's about recognizing your audience as well. Like yeah. going back to that Dower Man initiative, he, he's 
specifically trying to target a certain type of person. Yeah. And that's exactly who came. Do you know what I mean? Because if it was silly, mm. then it was silly for some people, but it wasn't mm. for the people that he was trying to get. Yes. And that's why the messages were packed. And that's why he had the success he did with mm. the audience he was trying to seek out. And mm. I think it's, you know, it's phenomenal, you know. So I think same thing. If you know who you're after, you know who you're trying to reach, mm. then yeah, a lot of people are going to say, not going to appeal to them, but to the mm. ones that you want, they're the ones yeah. that are going to come. Yeah. And that's why even the book, like, look, bro, like I'm a marketer, so I have to do the marketing well, right? And I think, uh, you know, months ago, mm. I, I thought of how will I kind of market the book? What, because the marketing needs to factor into the product as well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. I, even when I was thinking of how I structure the book, um, like the structure I ended up with is like the first section is about the self. How do you, how do you kind of work on yourself first to be a mm. good Muslim man? Then it's with the family and then it's with like the wider community slash the ummah. Yeah. This is the, the format I put it in. Now, that's how I'm calling it now to you, like these three kind of boring sounding sections. But the way I've put it in the subtitle so far is like a Muslim man's guide to finding the perfect wife earning respect and finding your purpose in the world. Ooh, right. Wow. So, because this is what, this is, this is the thing you got to think of the, the audience, the audience, uh, you know, a youngish Muslim man, let's say um, maybe 20 to 30, let's say, these are the things on his mind, right? Uh, a man, I, he either wants a wife or he's, he wants a, he wants to keep his wife. He wants his wife to really respect him. So that's the first, like, that's a big one, right? Then you've got the, um, I, I, I'm, I think I'm getting the subtitle right because I wrote two versions of it. Then you've got the whole respect thing. Every, every man wants respect, no doubt about that. Yeah? Respect. And then it's about having purpose. And I feel like uh, Muslim men who, um, they're, they're kind of, they love Allah. They want to do something good in the world. They might not know what to do. And so it's about giving them that thing that you need to become a leader. Like um, if you're not going to do it, who's going to do it? And these kind of traits mm. um, of many times mentioned in the Quran, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى uh, and and from the from the extreme side of the city, uh, a man came striving. A man came rushing, right? And and the word rajul is, is is used. The man came striving, and so usually they're coming striving to stand up to the status quo. Yeah. Right? So for example, uh, when there were three three messengers being uh, rejected by the people in Surah Yasin, the man comes. What they say? He he says he goes to the people. Imagine a group of people all rejecting prophets of Allah. And then he goes to them and he tells them, follow the prophets. He, like, he puts yeah. his neck on the line. Imagine like a kind of a mob situation where they already rejected the prophets. Yeah. So then he's coming. Yeah. And uh, in, in a, I think it was Tafsir al-Tabari, he says that it is, I think it's from the Israeli, Israeliyat, that uh, this man, he was actually a very generous man, but he, and he was a blacksmith, so not the most respected guy. And he had... Um, he had some uh, like leprosy, he had a, quite an illness, but he went out there and he did it. Like, he, he stood up, right? And this is one of the traits of a man standing up to the, against the status quo, against uh, what is the norm, a negative norm. And he said, follow the messengers. And what you infer from the ayat that come after that is that he was actually killed by those people, right? Mm. Because of that. And many times uh, you, you hear the same phrase in the, in the Quran, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْسَى Madina, وَجَاءَ رَجُلْ yeah, like for example, there's one man who stood up to Fir'aun and he was part of Fir'aun's people, but he stood up to them, it stood up to Fir'aun and he was actually a Muslim, but he was hiding it. But so mm. again, it's the, it's the theme of standing up. So this is the third section of the book, which is about finding your purpose and how do you interact with the wider community beyond your family, right? So it's like about brotherhood, it's about leadership, it's about uh, challenging the status quo and stuff. So yeah, man, it's like, if anybody really, really I, I, what I wanted to do on this, on this episode is like recommend that people, you know, if you think you've got it in it, uh, got it in you, you think you can put the work in because it's not, it's not easy. And, you know, like me, I'm sure I'm going to get demolished when I send it to someone to kind of help me out and, and correct it and stuff. But if you find a cause that you think work needs being done on, I would, you know, recommend you put it into a book and then from the book, it, it can become other things, right? But the book is just the building block kind of thing. Um, then I would say, you know, try and do it. I'm um, definitely uh, knowing Arabic helps a lot because I would say most of my uh, research came from Arabic sources, right? Some tefasir, which are not translated into English from uh, different uh, quotes from different scholars from, uh, for example, um, uh, Fath al-Bari from uh, Ibn Hajar that's not translated, right? It's like one of the best uh, explanations of uh, Sahih Bukhari. So 
uh, yeah, Arabic really helps. But maybe you can you can find a teacher who can kind of uh, help you with that stuff. Um, mm. But the point is that Pardon. think of the think of a topic that you think really needs addressing. Uh, know that it's going to take commitment and work, and then know that. Uh, the marketing also plays a, a role and you've got to kind of find a hook for it and find an angle that is going to be attractive. You are the mar marketing guy. Maybe uh, one day you can, once this is launched, you can start consulting for um, people who want to write their own books as well. Yeah, definitely. I thought of that, you know, like if I get success with this, um, mm. because I, the way I'm going to, once like uh, this launch good campaign is just getting some initial support um, for the initial printing and this stuff like this. But once I actually launch it, it's up for sale. You can buy it from, from the website and stuff. Um, inshallah, what I want to do is I want to get this uh, cycle going where it's like I pay for ads, people buy the book, the money from the book goes back into the ads. And that way I'm sure I can sell hundreds of copies of this, right? Mm -hmm. And if I can prove that model, then um, I don't see why I can't like help other people do the same. Um, and so I don't know if I'll become like a focus purely on Muslim book marketing might be too niche, right? But uh, I think I think it's a very interesting area. I think it's an interesting oh, area. Man. Oh, man. I'm excited, bro. I really am. Because it's good to see you actually, um, you know, on your way to achieve this. Because I know you've been wanting, you've been working on something. I don't know if you've been working on this, this topic, but you have definitely been working on the, you know, the idea to write a book for a long time, I think. Mm, yeah, yeah. Like, I think the idea was over a year ago, but the work was like a year ago. Um, mm. But on and off, on and off. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, if anyone's interested, then obviously definitely, def definitely email us, and I'll try and help you out. Um, but yeah. we're on. Um, you're on. Uh, so your your second is it your second goal is on two thousand, and you're at one thousand four hundred now. Yeah. With uh, fifty eight supporters, six days left. Allahi barak. Mm. Bro, should be good, bro. Should be good. And I like what you've done here. You've got very. I don't even know if they can see. And it's too bright. I've got an awful. <laughs> okay. Got lower, oh, there we go. Yeah. It's there we go. Look at that. I've got lots and lots and lots of info. Yeah. Um, You're talking to a marketer out here, bro. Trust me, bro. There was a video I pick up top. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, at the top. Yeah. Come up, my bag. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So you can find all the information at uh, launchgood.com slash better men. Uh, we'll obviously put a uh, link in the description. And uh, really, you know, it's a, it's a mixture between do you want like to just pre-order and do you want to like support it? Because like I said, um, I want to push this out there. And I was speaking actually to a book publisher. This was not like I didn't uh, seek out to speak to him, but it was kind of somebody seeking out um, to work with us, like Muslim CEO and stuff uh -huh. uh, in my business. And so he was a publisher in Canada, Muslim publisher. And he said something very interesting. He said that, book uh, covers are very important because a lot of people don't read the books, but they want it to look nice on the bookshelf. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, people think of that. And I, I never thought of that myself. So that was a really solid point. And uh, it, it's just about, he's like, in the end, it's, it's a book, but it's also a decoration. Right. And, and it goes yeah. on the bookshelf or it goes on the coffee table. And so you've got to invest in that stuff. Definitely. Because think about it. It's going to be on the page where you buy it. It's going to be in the ads. Maybe it's going to be uh, when people buy it, that excitement yeah. when you see that high quality thing. So um, these are the kind of areas which I feel I need to be done properly because this is not um, a one year thing and I'm done with it. it this, this needs uh, a good time being invested in promoting and putting it out there, you know? Hmm. Fun enough. Then again, a lot of books are put on their side, aren't they? So you make, you got to make sure that the spine looks good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was just looking at my books now. I'm like, well, oh, actually, that one looks good. But, uh, <laughs> <it's fine. laughs> Fair enough, bro. Life better. May Allah make it successful for you, bro. Honestly, Amin, it's Allah. a really, really good Amin. initiative. Amin. I haven't seen anything like it, so. Mm. There's, there's been a a few books on launch good, but not oh, too many, I'll, Wallah. Not too many. I think our chat keeps pausing. Hmm. Well, I, I heard you, so. Yo, Muhammad. Oh, I'm here. You, okay. you, you went all, you froze and then you started speaking yeah. a million miles an hour very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I think it's the lockdown, but everyone's just chilling at home. Yeah, using up all that UAE data. You know, yeah. speaking of UAE, I've been watching a show on YouTube from the, mm. the glorious UAE. You've probably seen it. It's um, Qalbi Itma'inna. Have you heard of that? No. Qalbi, how do I say it? Qalbi Itma'inna. 
where they you know, I heard of it. I thought it was like a big deal in the UAE because it's a. Mm. It's I live one, in a bubble anyway. <laughs> really? Oh, bro, it's such a good show, bro. Mm. Essentially, it's basically this anonymous guy. Yeah, he's got he's got a hat on like me. He's got a hood up. He's got a backpack. Okay. He travels around the Muslim world, and he basically just yeah, and he, he just he's barai, and he just finds people that are. I, I think people nominate fellow people so that even like someone who's going through a hardship someone who's you mm. know going through poverty someone who's poor or whatever um they'll be nominated so let's say hypothetically it was you i would nominate you to this guy and he would go there with his crew and he would pretend it was almost he'd obviously he wouldn't he'd never show his face so we don't even know who he is he essentially goes up to them um finds a way of you know getting 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 them sort of to talk to them and stuff so for example i'd say to you i mean i'll meet me at such and such place at this time i'll meet you there in a bit and then whilst you're waiting there he this guy turns up and starts just basically makes a conversation with you mm. and what he'll do is he almost like test them by asking them for a favor so he's had it where he went to tunisia at one point and he went up to this little sort of bakery sort of shop where this you know elderly woman makes sandwiches and stuff and he will ask her, oh, could I have a sandwich? Oh, I haven't got any money. I've just realized I haven't got any money, blah, blah, blah. And she just, you know, straight up forces him to have one for free kind of thing. Mm. And because of that, not not just because of that, but because of that, that's when he sort of says, oh, actually, this is why I'm really here. And he'll give them a piece of paper and he'll say basically what he's here to do. Mm. For this particular woman, she was, you know, I'll just give you an example. She she had all sorts of health, health conditions. She lost her family she's and the family that she does have she is like basically supporting them financially she mm. hardly has a penny to her name but you know she can't afford med- medication she can't afford this and that whatever but she still she found it in herself and she always finds it in herself to be charitable herself you know mm. so you know they'll come uh, on the paper it says you know you're going to get a new bakery you're going to move to a new house all your medical bills are going to be taken care of it's basically like straight up charity wow. bro like it's incredible mm. um and the the brother's just absolute like anonymous bro like and that's the, the whole message they send is that you can do it too because a lot of stuff that they do after they've done it they show like all these kids dressed exactly the same way he is also mm. giving out charity in different parts wow. of the world refugee camps stuff like that yeah and it's incredible bro it's all available on youtube there's i think there's i think at the moment they do one episode every day but i'm on mm. um, i what, think what channel uh, like produced it or which channel that it's i don't know if it's i'm assuming it's on tv However, mm. I'm a, all I do is, all I follow is the YouTube, all I'm subscribed to is the mm. YouTube channel themselves. Mm. What's um, the YouTube Qalbi, channel? It's called Qalbi Atma'in. Oh, right. Okay. And it's, well. they've got 3.43 million subscribers. Mm. <laughs> they definitely, they raise funds. You can see they raise funds, but specifically, I see the, the numbers that you text to raise the funds that all look like, you know, um, UAE numbers or whatever. Mm. Um, but actually that, it's the... Um, the spirit of giving, so to speak, yeah. <laughs> is what was really phenomenal. Because I think <laughs> there's almost like this forgotten people, really, in between the West and 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 those that are like very poverty stricken and war torn and stuff. The ones that we know about, you know, when actually there are people that are living in very difficult times and difficult situations all around the world, especially in the Muslim world. Mm-hmm. Um, Subhanallah. The one of them he went to. Uh, somewhere in Somalia and this uh it was literally in the middle of nowhere bro like a, almost like a desert bro no water for like 35 minutes I think it was like 30, you, had to, you had to travel 35 minutes to get the nearest water source so he goes up to this this guy and he's and he's, he's basically got a hut and he's surrounded with 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 thorn thorn bushes as a you know like a barrier like a walk. he walks up there and he says oh you know so like Mahi, um, you know we were traveling doing photography and we've broken down could you lend us some water mm. he just doesn't hesitate bro goes get some water and it's a, it's a bit dirty but it is what it is you know yeah and then uh you know gets his story one thing leads to another he finds out he's a quran teacher he's like oh you know what we're going to build you a whole mother so here and you're going to teach it and you're going to get salary as well and we're going to also dig a well for the community and then it ends with like they obviously they bring the drill to come and yeah. dig the well and the water yeah. just goes everywhere and you see the whole village the whole locale is just dancing because Aww. of the, this water like oh, and I, I recommend everybody just look it up Amazing. they may have they may have seen clips of it already because there some clips of the show have been going viral yeah but it's actually it's really motivated me to do more 
in in terms of physically in person mm. as opposed to just like donating online or doing something online you know mm. um because actually uh, you know he says it a lot but it's like the being able to give is way more rewarding than actually hoarding it yourself you know the people that are hoard the people that hoard stuff keep stuff are more mm. often the most unhappy people because they're never satisfied mm. but the smile that you get from giving yeah is priceless bro that's probably the net where the name of the show comes from isn't it like definitely, when you yeah. give you know yeah yeah definitely bro definitely you know I, actually I don't know who he is bro that, yeah I don't know who is he, he is, but like, something tells me that he might be like, yeah, so mm. he's in Marathi, but he, you never see his face. Mm. I can tell he's got a beard because mm. sometimes when he, when he's talking from behind, you can sort of see mm. a few hairs from his beard. <laughs> um, but a lot of who he is, I, some part of me feels like he might be like, um, I don't know, maybe he's like a royalty, like member of the royal family or something. And, mm. Do you know what I mean? And he's doing it like kind of hush, hush. Allahu mm. alam, Allahu alam, nobody knows, but mm. honestly. Interesting. Yeah, bro, you know, uh, speaking of that, I was thinking, you know, when it comes to zakah, I've always usually just given to charities. But I saw a post from Sheikh Abu Isa, and even then my, my dad also mentioned a similar thing. It's like the best way to give zakah is just somebody you know who's poor, either, you know, distant family or yeah. uh, in the neighborhood, and just give it to them. And it, like if everyone did yeah. that, obviously, it would really hook things up. Because, like, I'm not, I don't want to, like, uh, paint all the charities with the same brush, but... I, you know, sometimes uh, maybe they have justifications for, for why they do it or how they do it, but um, it's just more direct and purer to just give to someone straight, you know? So I've been thinking yeah. of... I mean, I suppose... Hmm, I've been thinking of giving it, like, giving my zakah this year to, like, uh, somewhere in Algeria, like, family who, uh, you know, distant family who we know for sure are poor. Yeah. And so it's like, that's a clean, yeah. simple one. Like, I can get my cousin to just go give it to them direct. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I mean, bro, we, uh, when I was in Tunisia back in 2011, bro, it was the first time I did like a Ramadan there in, since I was practicing myself and I was aware yeah. of Dean and stuff. And I don't know if I've spoken about this before, but Zakat al Fitr was obviously due. And mm -hmm. I just, I was just hanging around with some brothers that were practicing. I just thought, oh, we're we just going to put some money down. But I realized, oh, we're actually in a Muslim country. Yeah. I don't need to do the whole money thing because that's something that we, uh, we unfortunately limited to here mm. so how do they do it bro we got up like early um in the back of a truck bro we went mm. to town and, and and then we bought like bags of rice and bags of pasta and bags of god knows what else just mm. like loaded this truck up and then obviously i don't really know who's poor and who isn't in in my locale but we ended up like driving to the middle of nowhere places that i was just like and they would literally just drop the bag knock on the door you know wave and go like they wouldn't you know what I mean? And I just thought, oh my God, this is what it's about. Like, this is the real deal. Bro. Yeah. This is what yeah. it should be. This is how mm. it should be done. Mm. You know? Yeah. Because, um, you know, like, of, because like I said, it's the forgotten people here, bro. Yeah. Zakat al Fitr is like, um, it's supposed to be given like as uh, staple food, right? Like grains or mm. um, whatever. And so uh, that's something definitely to check when it comes to paying your Zakat al Fitr because some charities might not do that. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if there's a difference of opinion, but mm. definitely what I learn and what I follow is that it must absolutely must be in the grain, right? Or in the rice or whatever the yeah. local thing is. Yeah. So I know like Ithar Relief, um, they definitely give it as food because I emailed them and they, they told me they give it as food. Um, but then there's nothing better than giving it yourself. And even, even in the UK, for example, um, there's going to be people who just lost their jobs, right? Uh, there's going to be poor people. So if you know of them, then you can also give them rice. I mean, it's not like people don't eat rice in England. Um, so, so yeah, there's that as well. Definitely. I, I did a live stream with Musa, Musa Adnan on Instagram yesterday. I think it was mm. yesterday. We just spoke about this a lot and we spoke about how it can be, you know, do it, Charity, in essence, is one of the easiest things to do. It's quicker, and it can, in this day and age, is quicker than praying to rakat. Do you know what I mean? You can <laughs> yeah. literally just tap on your phone these days. Like, there's this app that I've got, subhanAllah, it's called Share the Meal. Share the Meal. Okay. Once you've all logged in and stuff, you can essentially just, look, look how simple that is. Like, okay, mm. give now. And then boom, it takes you straight to how many meals and then you click give and it's Apple Pay and it's done. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And it, they always have a different, uh, the ease of that is just phenomenal. I think that's one thing that kind of, um, it doesn't, I hope charities can sort of sort that out one day. It's just get apps 
just ease the process, bro. Streamline that process because how many times have I gone into, you know, a web, you know, website? Yes, gift, blah, 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 and then it's like it takes me 10, 15 minutes just to get one thing done. Yeah. Um, um, my own Instagram. I don't know if anybody has noticed. I spoke about something called Mini Deed. I don't know if you do you remember. I might have yeah, mentioned yeah. it to you. Uh, and it's actually a really cool initiative, a social media platform that um, essentially instead of giving likes to posts, you are donating pennies towards a charity of their choice. So what I've been doing is posting some of the graphics stuff that I do. I, I'll, I'll give you an example like this one, for example. So I posted this. Mm. By the way, we, we are recording this on um, video. We forgot to mention that. A lot of people yeah. don't know that we do video now. But for this example, I put this post up uh, and instead of just getting likes like I did on Instagram, you tap this button and I'll do it to myself. Yeah. I've got mine set to 10p. So I tap once and that's 10p donated to what I've chosen is lonely orphans yeah. and other people would have their same. And then you so get charged post, like at the end of the month. Post, or... sorry, 50. Yeah. I think at this stage it's at the end of the month. So um, it says on your profile. So at the moment I know it's, you know, I've crowdfunded. So through my posts, I've raised 20 pounds, which is great. Do you know mm. what I mean? For doing nothing, just posting stuff. And then it also shares how much you, how much you've put towards mm -hmm. my liking and stuff as well. Mm. So I think it's a really cool initiative. I think like, bro, stuff like that should be like the, the go-to Muslim media, like Muslim social media. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that, that would be, be sick. What yeah. we're doing. That and you know, so sick if, oh, yeah. if we use that. Mm. De definitely, bro. There's a, there's a few apps coming out there like that now. So Launch Good is obviously not an app, but it's like a website where they've made the process quite smooth because they've got their your card on file and everything. And a lot of charities started yeah. using that, even though they've got their own website, right? And then you've got a client of ours actually is Feeling Blessed. I think it's feelingblessed.org. And they've got an app and basically... Um, they, they're getting as many charities and Masajid on board as possible. And the idea is, yeah, it's like all the different charities and Masajid uh, are there in the app. Your card is away, already on file and you just go and give and like a few taps and you've given, right? Um, I think it's mostly uh, US Brilliant. focused right now. Uh, but yeah, they're doing really good stuff. Um, and they're going to de definitely see them growing. Uh, definitely one of the most kind of um, uh, the clients with the most potential. I could see them doing really, really well, inshallah. And um, uh, then you've got what you just uh, shared, a mini deed, right? There's that. So I think the technology is like coming out there, helping us to do these kind of things. Um, and I was thinking, bro, you know, like giving zakat on 27th Ramadan, for example. It, can you imagine like a yeah. few hundred years ago where people's like, yeah, yeah, like I've got to time it. So it's like 27th, I'm going to give. It's like if you go out on the night, the 27th night of Ramadan, you might not find anyone, right? <laughs> so I wonder how they used to do yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, subhanAllah. Because I suppose now, once we let go of it, that's our job done. That's what when we actually, feel like, yeah. That's what we feel like. But really, it's, it's, it should have been when it, when it was actually given to someone. Because we don't know how long that money sits there before yeah. it's directly enacted. It might be months. You, you don't know, yeah. yeah. Now, I'm not saying like we're doing it wrong. I don't know exactly. I'm sure, I'm guessing that the ruling is that, yeah, it's still accepted. You paid it at that time and everything. But it's just funny, like, we just click buttons and, and usually that's how we send Zakir. We pay our Zakir, but... This is it, bro. Um, like, one of the biggest blessings is Allah has allowed us to click buttons right now. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, this is what I was saying last night on the stream. I just said, like, don't piss up on this opportunity. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has... You know, certain doors have been closed for us. Like Masajid have been closed for us. The, uh, Hajj yeah. Umrah at the moment, at least, closed for us, you know. Mm. Um, but you know, even even fasting, as as, sim as simple as it is, fasting can be very difficult for people, you know, based on the situation that they're in. But mm. to be able to just give something, even if it's not money, just to give, just to you know, you've got something. You, even if it's like I don't know a book, Achi, or something that you haven't used, or as long as mm. it's in good condition or whatever, or just time to give, even to give time yeah time even to help someone do someone mm. a favor, even to you know, so you know you're aware that. Something simple, like, oh, you know, it's, I've never done it myself, but I could imagine, you know, someone needs their, their grass mowing or something like that. Do you know, do you know what I mean? I'm sure yeah. that's... I think, bro, if you, what you'll find in the UK, even for students who, you know, students, so they're not really earning money, um, they would value an hour of their time over 10 or 20 pounds. Definitely. Especially if that mm. hour requires some kind of effort and work. Um, and that's something to think of because like, 
right? You won't attain, you know, mm. righteousness or goodness until you give from what you love, right? So what do you value more? You know, try and, for me, it's like, I can't say that I do this. I mean, I, I need to really find some more opportunities to give with my time and my effort. But for me, that helps a ton in terms of uh, sincerity and therefore, inshallah, in terms of acceptance, because it's just harder. It's way harder for me to give an hour of my time than uh, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, right? I value that hour mm. more. So therefore I should give it, right? Because I value it more, I should give yeah. it. And maybe yeah. you can give a lot more money than you can time. That's fine. But it's like, give a little time just to feel that sacrifice that you're doing for the sake of Allah, isn't it? And every, everyone, I think what the most important thing is everybody's different. Everybody knows themselves better than, you know, you, I would know myself better than you would know me. So I would know what my capabilities are, what I can challenge myself with and what I can set for myself as like, like a goal. And like, yeah. I've, I feel like I've convinced myself at least, especially this Ramadan, I've, I've swallowed that, that pill, which, and when I say that pill, I mean that, that hadith that says that you're, your wealth doesn't decrease essentially with charity, you know? And I think I've, I've finally sort of fully accepted that where I've set myself the, the, the challenge that if I believe this is true, then I shouldn't fear anything whatsoever. Mm. You know, and I've, I feel like I've fully believed that to the point where now, um, at a time of my life where I'm finally able to save and able and should be saving because of the stuff that I'm planning to do, I find myself actually able to give more Mm. Um, and that's like hopefully that's like passing the test isn't it of having that extra exactly and, I, I, and I'd like to think that that's me saying well you know what I've got my toeco I've got this you know I believe this yeah. and this act of mine is now the, the, mm. the investment that I'm making not yeah. the putting the money and hoarding it and whatever the act of giving is the investment I'm trying to make yeah um, mm. and, I think and that's why it's know, like uh, giving is an act of it's like an imani act Right, it's an act that proves your tawakkul. It proves your, yeah. you know, people like to use the word aqidah and they start thinking of okay, the three different types of tawheed and stuff. Yeah, that's that's good, but practical aqidah is I have tawakkul, therefore I give money that I really could do with and I would like yeah. to have. Yeah. That that is like aqidah in action. Yeah, that's um, that's I advise everyone to sort of look at themselves now and just think, what is it that I've got? Like I've 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 got things now that I'm battling because part of me wants to give it away. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like I've got things now where I'm like, oh, do you know what? I should give that away. Despite the fact that I use it all the time, every day. And I really, but do you know what? If I really believed in this, I would give it away. Mm. And I think I have this conversation, this battle with myself every single day about there's things that I use daily. Okay, and I'm thinking, what well, hypothetically, if I gave it away, could I manage without, I probably could. Why don't I, I know you're thinking of your PlayStation, bro. That's what you're thinking. thinking of, oh yeah. I'm thinking <laughs> stuff, yeah. Yeah. That's one. That's a good example, actually. But definitely no, actually stuff like that. I value a lot. Stuff oh. I value a lot. And I think, Oh, do you know what? Bro? Shouldn't I just give that away? Wouldn't that be the test? Isn't that true? You meant to do that, and it's mm. just like, oh, you just, you know, you keep going with it. But mm. Mm. that's like the dance of life. I mean, <laughs> I mean, bro. Um, Actually, it's almost Maghrib here, bro. I've just realized. No way. Yeah. Subhanallah, it's uh, eight thirty. Right. Eight thirty here. Yeah. Yeah. Here. When is when is Maghrib exactly? Maghrib like? in about twenty minutes, I believe. Wow. Okay. Got to get those yeah. burak going. Yeah, I gotta see. Gotta see if my <laughs> missus needs any help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, it's been a really good episode. It's been a while, been but uh, we, we've been back with a really good episode, inshallah. Um, I want to share. I want to just share a few last things, right? So obviously, we talked about the link for for the campaign. If you want to contribute, that's in the description. But also, I made a video on my channel, which in the description of that video is a spreadsheet with all different charities and links to just go and donate. So it's not quite an app like Muhammad would like me to make, right? <laughs> but um, it's a few links where we'll you get can just there. We'll like, get there. yeah, where you could just like click and then you're right on the place where you donate. So I thought that's that's kind of useful because you don't want to spend half an hour every of the last ten days um, looking for uh, what where to give. It's just like laid out there. So um, I did that last year, and I'll just uh, I'll, I'll actually why not put the link for that as well in the description? But it's on Sierra Master's YouTube channel if you're looking that way as well. Um, so yeah, bro. Um, anything else to, to end with? Um, no, I'm just good. It's glad. It's, I'm glad to, to be back. Um, please check out Mind Heist podcast. Is it Mind Heist? Oh, I can't remember. Podcast.com. Yeah. 
firehousepodcast.com for yeah. all the links and stuff we're also on youtube now so if you're listening to this and you um you want to see us battle with zoom then <laughs> we're on zero masters youtube channel um a few plugs i've got are not mine but I've got the mini deed app i think everyone should check that out it's, i'd love to see that flourish i really would um and also, that show that I was talking about, Qalbi Itma in Qalbi mm. in English, I think they're spelling it with a Q, Q A L B Y. Oh, Y. B Y, yeah. And then they've got E T M A A N. Um, very powerful, man. Very, mm. very powerful. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, check those things out. And that's, that's all from me, Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Okay, great stuff, man. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Like we said, mindhouchpodcast.com for like any questions, suggestions, email, all of that. And yeah, see you next time, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu wa na ilaha anta. Astaghfiruka wa tubu alaykum. Assalamu alaikum wa